Yeah, we call that increased job security. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating to see this, and, and you're exactly right. People look at the, the mission of border security, but we also have this incredible uh, responsibility for economic security. And as the congressman mentioned, slowdowns in trade and slowdowns in travel cost us not only time, but they cost us money also. So there are a couple game changers. One is that I think uh, if you look at the history of the United States Customs Service, which is now over 225 years old, it was basically a revenue collector. After 9-11, uh, as the earlier panel mentioned, this combining of the United States Customs Service, the United States Border Patrol, our agriculture inspection, inspections all into one face at the border makes a lot of sense rather than three different port directors. Uh, we also recognize that the additional game changer is in two places. One is in technology. So whether it's kiosks or mobile passport control, non-intrusive inspection devices, uh, the sharing of images that will occur uh, when the West Rail opens uh, at the end of this month, the first rail uh, connection in 100 years uh, uh, to be open. Those are, uh, the technology is truly a game changer. We have a finite number of people and trade has increased and travel has increased. So the other thing that's out there is that the fact that there are the private sector stakeholders that because of authorization through Congress can actually pay for additional services. And uh, my congratulations uh, certainly to the governor because Santa Teresa is one of those that was just designated as a port in which the private sector can say, we need some additional help and we need some additional personnel to clear things. We're willing to pay for it as long as you're willing to tell us exactly how that money is being used. And in the private sector, are we getting a bang for the buck? And we have seen that repeatedly. So we see that it is much more of a collaborative effort. It is much more of, of dialogue and communication uh, and, mu and much less of, well, we'll do it the government's way. We work to co-create our rules uh, rather than just drop our rules into the public sector and private sector. Thank you very much. And let me just build on that. I have a couple questions specifically for the other two panels we haven't touched on yet. But I, I just wanted to focus in on this concept of uh, the role of local communities, the role of the private sector, uh, and the role of the, the federal governments, really, in making sure that we have the staffing and infrastructure that we need at, at the ports of entry. And this is something that we've really, there's been a lot of conversation about over the last several years. What is the right balance uh, between all of those, those three levels uh, of government? What's the role of each of them? Uh, in El Paso also, we've had a use of the, the Section 560 program, and now perhaps 559 as well, which allows staffing to be paid for uh, in this case by the city actually, using some of the funds from toll revenue. Uh, but I wonder if we could have a, a conversation a little bit about, you know, I, I think there are several questions it brings up. You know, one is how do we get enough resources on the table so that we have efficiency at the ports of entry? A and then two, is this the long-term sort of solution? Will we always have private and public participation, uh, private funding of staffing, or, or, or is this something we should consider sort of a temporary fix? And I really just want to throw this out there for, for anyone who wants to talk about it. Sure, I'll take the first crack at that. It's, um, it depends, right? You know, I think that balance is going to be different um, at, at different points in time. And we're always going to have to have cooperation between the public and, and the private sector on, on something that's valuable uh, to, to both of us. And, you know, uh, Gil and his folks have a really hard job. And, you know, we can secure our borders and facilitate the movement of goods and services at the same time. But it, it's going to take all of us in order to do that. You know, right now we're working on a couple of projects where we're allowing states to use up to 5% of their federal highway dollars on trade issues within 100 miles of the border. That's another tool for, for states to, to use that in order to facilitate the, the movement of goods and services. So this is something that's gonna constantly be changing and we need to be prepared for it. And, and to your, your, your earlier point about what, do our, what does our border look like, I think it's something where you don't have wait times, it's moving back and forth. I want our, our ports of entry to kind of look like airports, you know, I want to see a Whataburger at, you know, the, the, the entry point um, ba back and forth between, between here and, and, and Juarez. So, you know, th this is, we got to be creative and, and we got to solve these problems together. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to, to say that I'm, I'm 
kind of torn on this. On the one hand, I'm incredibly proud of this community. Uh, the dedicated commuter lane that we have here uh, was really the inspiration of the local community, the Foreign Trade Association, the El Paso Chamber of Commerce, the stakeholders uh, who wanted to be able to move across more quickly and would go through those background checks and pay a little extra to do so. This uh, 560 and 559 programs, again, the local community is paying for the staffing and perhaps infrastructure going forward. You have El Paso, Texas, which from a property tax basis, and even if you compare us uh, income to income versus the national average, we're poorer than the average American community, and yet we are paying for a basic federal responsibility, the benefit of which is not just going to accrue to us, it will accrue to those factory floor jobs in, in Michigan. So again, I think our unique challenge uh, that all of us have is connecting what needs to happen here with the benefit that is gained by the, the, the country at large and then getting that investment. So I'd like to see that local leadership continue. Uh, I just think we need to do a better job of matching that with federal investment. I know that Will and I are going to continue to work on that, but I really think that's the, that's the challenge. Yeah, thanks. Does anyone else want to jump in on that one? Okay. Senator, uh, you have the tough position here to be the only person representing Mexico. Uh, you're representing the country of Mexico, you're representing the state of Chihuahua, and also your city of, of Ciudad Juarez. But I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what it is that Ciudad Juarez and Chihuahua need in particular uh, regarding the, the border, the way we manage the border. Certainly Ciudad Juarez has a very unique economy. I mean, it's the birthplace of the maquiladora. It's a hugely important manufacturing city uh, and, and an incredibly big one. Uh, all those businesses put demands on the border. So, uh, Senadora nos va a hablar en español, entonces si, if you guys need uh, translation equipment, please, please use that. Pero Senadora, háblenos un poco de, de cómo es que, que Ciudad Juárez y Chihuahua son únicos en sus necesidades, qué, qué es lo que necesita México en términos de, del manejo de la frontera para su prosperidad, para su ciudadanía. Bueno, primero que nada, la frontera entre México y Estados Unidos es una relación estratégica, así lo vemos en el estado de Chihuahua, particularmente en Ciudad Juárez, donde tenemos una mano de obra altamente calificada y que tenemos que agilizar y cómo tener la colaboración, sobre todo entre legisladores, que es muy importante, existen ya mecanismos muy facilitadores para este diálogo que se da, pero también entre los gobiernos, cómo se ha venido trabajando intensamente entre el gobierno, sobre todo de Nuevo México, que me da gusto saludar a Susana, muchas gracias Susana por estar aquí. Cómo viene trabajando el gobernador César Duarte, el presidente Enrique Peña Nieto, para facilitar precisamente este intercambio de mercancías y este intercambio comercial que existe, que más allá de ver como cómo obstaculizar el tráfico y el traslado de mercancías, tenemos que potencializar esta visión estratégica y este punto estratégico que tenemos en una frontera que es entre México y Estados Unidos. En ese sentido, el gobierno mexicano viene invirtiendo y ya está más o menos para finales de este año terminar el puente Guadalupe Tornillo, que dará también mayor facilidad para este intercambio de mercancías y también la colaboración que debe existir entre los gobiernos locales es muy importante para lograrlo. Desde la posición en el Senado de la República, como representante por el Estado de Chihuahua, trabajamos en conjunto con los gobiernos, siendo facilitadores y que por ello yo celebro que se dé este intercambio con lo del Poder Legislativo aquí en Estados Unidos y sobre todo con las autoridades para ver cómo colaborar en facilitar un mejor traslado de mercancías. El comercio entre México y Estados Unidos es el cuarto a nivel mundial, y eso quiere que decir que tenemos que tener la visión de ver cómo ocupar el primer lugar, porque somos aliados, somos socios estratégicos, más allá de diferencias ideológicas. Muchas gracias. Uh, Congressman Hurd, to, to go back to you a little bit, uh, you know, we, I talked at the beginning about the, the role that Congressman O'Rourke has played, helping educate some other legislators. I actually think that El Paso has a very unique advantage right now by having a Democrat and a Republican who have both taken on this banner and this responsibility of informing and educating some of their, their colleagues in, in Congress and, and others throughout the United States government what it means to be on the border, uh, to break down some of the distance that, that Senator Cuevas talked about between the capitals and the border itself. Tell us about how you do that. Tell us about how it is that you can 
help increase understanding in Washington, a place that oftentimes doesn't quite get the border? You know, everybody wants to talk about the border. So many folks have never been down to it. And so, so part of it is, is trying to get many of my colleagues down here to see it firsthand. And, you know, I, I spent nine years as an undercover officer in the CIA. Um, so I was, I was the dude in the back alley at four o'clock in the morning collecting intelligence. Um, I've been in some dangerous places. Uh, El Paso is not dangerous. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I always say, I, I had a rule. I had a rule. I, I was in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. I had a rule. If I, I know if an, an area is dangerous or not, if I saw a pretty girl walking a dog, you know, and I, um, we brought a couple of, of, of colleagues, and, and, and Woody Hunt talked about, alluded to this earlier, and we were over in, in Juarez having lunch, and we're pulling up, and they're like, well, look, there's a pretty girl walking a dog. Um, <laughs> and and so, so, so part of it is letting see people see this. And, and what's been interesting is I've been shocked at how open my colleagues are to, to um, understanding the realities down here. And you know, everybody, you know, there was one who believed in building a fence from sea to shining sea. And we, we went around and we saw San Diego, we saw Tucson, saw McAllen, he realized, he leaned over to me on the plane, he's like, building a fence ain't gonna work, is it? <laughs> and it's like, no. And so he realized that. And, and so, so seeing some of the rhetoric that these folks were using, and then when they come here and see it, they're able to, to realize what's really going on. And, and an important piece that is often left out with, with a lot of legislators is the business aspect and the, and the community aspect. You know, I, I think the senator in the, in the last uh, panel you know, mentioned this. Like on a lot of the business stuff, we, we're in agreement, but it's kind of the human issues that, that we, need to, we need to face. And, and so letting people see the totality of this area is great. And the folks here at the Borderplex Alliance you know, Rolando Pablos, um, Jesse Hereford at, at BTA, you know, folks that we're going to be hearing from later this evening um, have been great in helping us bridge that gap. Yeah, thank you. And one thing I've, I've learned and seen over time is that the federal government, they may have primary responsibility for running our ports of entry, but running our border does not work well if it's only the federal government who's playing a role. It has to be, there has to be a role for state governments, there has to be a role for local governments, uh, there, you know, a, a border crossing connects to a feeder road, which connects to a highway system, which connects to a city and factories and jobs and, and universities. Uh, none of this happens in isolation. And so I wonder if we could all sort of talk about the way that the levels of government can work together. What are the, the sort of the responsibilities and contributions that can be made at each level, you know, beyond just the, the public-private partnership question, but really thinking about how it is that the different levels of government can work together so that we can get to what we're talking about, an ideal border. Uh, I'm gonna throw that one wide open.